You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Four more years or 40 more winks. It was unbelievable, the scene, even by Joe Biden's recent standards. There he was, the president of Israel, America's closest ally, right at the center, always, of the possibility of war breaking out right across the Arab and Muslim world. Israel, there presumably for more hundreds of millions in subvention, were treated to Joe Biden's snores instead. He literally fell asleep while talking, no mean feat. He cannot possibly be the candidate. He's not running. He's not spending any money as the nominee. He hasn't got any staff on his presidential re-election bid. He cannot be serious, as John P. McEnroe would put it. Another four years of Rip Van Winkle. Mind you, the way things are going, you'll be lucky to see the end of the summer. Not only is the net closing in on his own corruption, but the destruction of the character of the son who's always with him, who seems to have the free run of the White House, even the Situation Room, where nuclear war might one day be launched, maybe sooner than we think. The Hunter Biden story is now turning from lurid to triple X-rated pornography. Marjorie Taylor Greene has just been holding up large laminated pictures, sex pictures of the presidential son who flies on Air Force One, who can come and go into the Oval Office as he pleases. He's now the subject of not one, but two IRS whistleblowers who recommended that he be prosecuted in the most severe way possible under IRS regulations. But he was protected by the FBI and by the Justice Department, laughingly called. The fact that he was going to walk free without not so much as an electronic tag for offenses, gun offenses, tax offenses, that have put other people in jail for years, turns out only to be the tip of the iceberg. The IRS wanted to prosecute him for charges on charges that would have put him in prison for many, many years. The fact that the FBI and the CIA and the Justice Department are standing sentinel, locked together, around the Biden crime family may well turn out to be the end, either the end of this presidency or definitely the end of another second term bid by Joe Biden. And no matter what they do to Donald Trump, well, his popularity keeps going up. They've indicted him now again in connection with the January 6th rumpus. It would have just been described as a rumpus in Europe. Compare it to France, for example, and would have been forgotten about by January the 8th. But the Yanks are still fixated on it and still indicting their former president around it. But what happened when they announced this latest indictment? bringing to 74 the number of felony charges that Donald Trump now faces. The opinion polls showed a rise in Donald Trump's popularity. So it doesn't look to me that anyone on the Republican side could even dream of stopping Trump or that anyone on the Democratic side will be able to stop Trump running for president. And I know a record number of people, 81 million, no less, voted for Joe Biden. 
<laughs> in the last presidential election, but nobody will believe any concocted, rigged election that puts Joe Biden back in the White House. So what is the deep state going to do about it? I'll be asking Gerald Salenti, one of the riest commentators in the United States, about that later in the show. But let me turn to a more British story. Although it's a story that may well be applicable across the Atlantic and even across the world. Nigel Farage is no political buddy of mine. Our views coincided over Brexit and we worked together and we won. And I will never resile from that or be in any way embarrassed about that. It was a truly epic victory led by him in a referendum that never would have happened other than as a result of his Herculean efforts, derided, reviled, but ultimately triumphant. But he's no political friend of mine. But I immediately leapt into the fray when it turned out that his bank had cancelled his bank account. And I know what that feels like. Not personally, because I have never had a day's problem with my bank, the Bank of Scotland, with whom I have banked for almost 40 years. But other people close to me and other organizations for which I've worked, other campaigns with whom I'm associated, have had untold politically motivated problems with banks. But never did I imagine that Nigel Farage, who is not a poor man, I'm sure about that, would be debanked, uh, as we now must describe it, debanked by the Queen's own bankers, Coots and Co., which is a very grand name and a grand old feature of British banking architecture, but was long ago taken over by the National Westminster Bank. Not so grand, not so historic. National Westminster was one of the banks that took Britain to the very edge of bankruptcy back in 2008. Too big to fail they were, so the state, the taxpayer, the public, had to take them over and bail them out. And the state still owns 40% of the National Westminster Bank, which owns Coots & Co, a royal subsidiary. Coots & Co took a decision. It now turns out on documents legally acquired by Farage, on the grounds that Farage did not represent their values, values, and was associated with people and things that contravened their ethics, ethics, banking, ethics, that he could no longer be a customer, even though he had plenty of money in the bank, even though his account had been administered by him absolutely properly and for many decades even though there was not a scintilla of wrongdoing on the part of Nigel Farage, they unceremoniously kicked him out of the bank, holding a check that he could go and find another bank to deposit his holdings in. Now, I don't know about you, but if a bank kicked me out, I'd assume that no other bank would be in a hurry to take me because on the principle that there's no smoke without fire, they would instantly conclude that Farage must have been up to no good. And that's precisely what the bank sought by subterfuge through its friends in the media, principally in the BBC, to imply or infer, certainly not to say, for that would be defamatory, wholly untrue as it was and as it is now proved to be. In fact, 
Farage has now obtained a 40-page dossier in which the bank's executives debate whether or not to debank one of the most famous people ever in the history of British politics. In the course of that 40-page dossier, they mentioned Russia 144 times, Trump 82 times, Brexit 62 times, and LGBTQ plus I issues 14 times. Apparently, Nigel Farage failed the test on all of those counts, even though he has nothing, nothing to do with Russia, has never had anything, anything to do with Russia. His opposition, very mild and meek, milk and water opposition to Joe Biden's war in Ukraine was enough to tip the balance. That and retweeting a joke by Ricky Gervais got Farage kicked out of the bank. Saw him wandering the streets of London with his check looking for a bank that would allow him to bank it. Now, of course, his friends leapt to the defense of the bank initially, though not today that the document has seen the light. They said that turned out that Farage just wasn't rich enough to bank with Coots and Co. That was a lie. A lie repeated ad nauseum on the BBC and in The Guardian in particular. Both of them working out their animus towards Farage, not on anything to do with banking, everything to do with Farage and Brexit and their obsession, love affair with the European Union. The liars lied, but the truth, as always, in the end, will out. And Farage is lucky that it has won out already. He demanded a subject access report from the bank, and thus the 40-page dossier is now with him. And he's just promised in the last 15 minutes there's more bad news for Coots and Co. and the National Westminster Bank and the banking community in general to be coming out tomorrow as a result of further whistleblowing and further investigation by Farage and people like me, like Andrew Neil, uh, the uh, right-wing famous former BBC journalist who's been playing a leading role in unmasking the truth behind this scandal. Now, why do I dwell upon all of this? Most of you in the world have never heard of Nigel Farage and have no particular interest in his banking travails. But here's why you should. You see, it's one thing if you own a restaurant taking the view that you'd rather not have Nigel Farage eating his way through a gourmet menu and choosing rather expertly, in my experience, from however an extensive wine list you may have. That arguably is your right. And Farage can go out and eat in another restaurant. But as even the British Prime Minister said today, banking was an essential service. Essential. In fact, it's legally protected in countries like Germany and France, where it is illegal to deny someone the right to open a bank account. And that's for very good reason. Because if you don't have a bank account, you might as well take a jump off the nearest bridge because you will not be able to work and live and pay bills in our 21st century society if you have no bank account. Moreover, people will conclude from the fact that you have no bank account 
that you must be a rum character indeed, to be shunned, certainly not to be employed and not to be afforded any kind of credit, not to be allowed a mortgage, a loan, or any other kind of essential interaction that people have now in 2023. But here's the real importance. Rishi Sunak, who came to Farage's aid this afternoon, although Kutz and co. have still not backed down, even with the Prime Minister, a billionaire, against them on this, Rishi Sunak, the WEF, the EU, the World Bank, the IMF are all headed firmly fast down the road towards the cashless society, the digital currency society. Can you imagine the power that would be given to the state and the banks if cash was no longer an option? If you could not buy a dinner in cash and had no bank card because the bank would not allow you to have a bank account, you would be up the creek without a paddle. And you might even starve to death. You would certainly struggle on a day-to-day basis with a level of social control exercised by the state and the private sector in a way that none of us could ever have dreamt of before, except in the realms almost of science fiction. We have to stop this journey in its tracks. Don't abolish cash. Don't allow them to abolish cash. If you do, you're handing them the power to strangle you, not just control your life, which to an extent they already do, but to strangle your very means of life up to and including the point that you may very well expire. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night tonight. It is the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. One man who knows the world better almost than anyone else is former U.S. intelligence officer and creator of one of the most priceless assets we now have online, the new Atlas, the one and only Brian Berlitek. Brian, welcome uh, back to the show. Let me start, if I may, uh, with this grain deal. The hue and cry has gone up that Russia is going to starve the poor people of the world, which is, of course, an endless preoccupation of Western leaders, how the people in the poorest parts of the world are doing today. Uh, But that's not, of course, at all True. The the grain deal was supposed to be an act of good faith by Russia to allow Ukraine to ship grain out of its ports, primarily Odessa. And this grain was supposed to go to countries in need, but it was not going to countries in need. It was going to Europe so much so that several nations in Eastern Europe, part of the European Union, had to protest the amount of Ukrainian grain flowing into Europe rather than to these countries that uh, now the UN says supposedly will be starving. And in addition to this, the the grain deal and the corridor that it opened in the Black Sea was being used to carry out attacks by Ukraine and its Western sponsors on targets in Crimea. And it is suspected that this most recent attack on the Crimean bridge was a result of Ukraine abusing this corridor that was supposed to be used only to ship grain. So uh, Ukraine and its friends uh, are seeking to uh, contest in practice the Russian cancellation uh, of the deal. Uh, I don't know who's going to ensure them, but 
Uh, they're threatening to sail ships into Odessa. I'm not sure of their fate there, but uh, they're, in other words, going to challenge Russia. Can they meaningfully do that? I don't think that they can. Uh, I believe that there is now going to be essentially a blockade, just as there was when the special military operation began in February 2022. Uh, I think the United States has openly said that they are not going to send warships in. I don't think anyone would be interested in doing that because that would be another step toward direct confrontation and possible war with Russia. And the whole point of fighting a proxy war at the expense of the Ukrainian people rather than at the expense of the U.S. and NATO is to not actually get directly involved. Now, you mentioned the latest attack on the bridge, which was uh, wildly celebrated in Western Ukraine, uh, even though the only casualties were a mother and father who were killed, leaving their 14-year-old daughter alive but an orphan uh, and in uh, serious condition in hospital. Russia called that an act of terrorism. It's difficult to call it anything else, isn't it? It is difficult to call it anything else because the, the roadways that are part of the Crimean Bridge are strictly civilian, for civilian use. Uh, at one point, Russia was using the railway uh, to move military equipment, but they haven't done that, uh, to my knowledge, in months since the last attack. And besides that, even if this bridge was entirely destroyed, and even if Ukraine could somehow punch through the layered defenses uh, in Zaporozhye at Kherson and cut the so-called land bridge, Crimea would still be able to sustain itself. Uh, people have to remember that this bridge was built in 2018. The Crimean Peninsula joined the Russian Federation in 2014. So for several years, it existed without a land bridge and without a physical bridge across the Kerch Strait. And uh, it could do that again. Uh, both the military facilities in Crimea and the civilian population could be sustained by air and by sea because that is how Crimea had sustained itself for several years. It was a performative act of terrorism, wasn't it? It had no military significance. The casualties, as I've said, were a, a small family destroyed uh, by this act of terrorism. There's no, I mean, in fact, the bridge is still open, still operating, just one lane uh, that is inoperable. And as you say, there are, there's now a land bridge uh, to Crimea as a result of the uh, of the liberation of that part of of the Donbass, uh, so it it was a peculiarly performative act because, of course, it will surely be answered by Russia. What do you think they might have in mind by way of an answer? It's, it's really hard to tell. We've already seen very significant strikes, particularly targeting the uh, seaports at Odessa, but that could have been a result of the grain deal collapsing and Russia's intent to ensure that no more shipping takes place uh, since the deal was was scrapped, basically. Um, that may, may have been part of the retaliation. There might be more to come. After the last attack on, the, on this bridge, there was the, the attacks on Ukraine's power grid, and that lasted for weeks, months, and it did extensive damage. And I believe that Russia has many escalations already planned out, and they would rather not exercise these options. But as, as Ukraine carries out these senseless attacks, uh, Russia has to respond in kind, or, or they will just simply embolden Ukraine to do, to do this even more. It foreshadows what I have thought and said from the beginning uh, is a likely consequence of the war, the loss of the, of the Black Sea uh, to Ukraine. Uh, at the moment, Odessa as a port is now non-operative. But it can't be, I think, the Russian intention to allow business as was uh, for Ukraine into the Black Sea, for that will always now be uh, a, a point of vulnerability for Russia. So uh, the liberation of the whole of the Black Sea coast, uh, including, of course, the great Russian city of 
Odessa must be one of the expanded war aims. And I may add, if you're going to do that, you might as well link up with Transnistria and liberate the Russian people there in Transnistria, uh, who are uh, subject to all kinds of, of threats. And indeed, the leader of the Transnistrian Communist Party was actually murdered this week because of his stand towards Russia. Yes, uh, I, I think that is very a very reasonable speculation. That's all we can do right now is speculate. We don't really know what Moscow is thinking in terms of the, the greater plan, but that would make sense to, if it's, in, if it's impossible to take or unfavorable to take all of Ukraine, especially the, the most Western parts of Ukraine, and at least take the the sea the sea coast to deny them access to the Black Sea and leave whatever is left of this essentially NATO controlled occupied Ukraine leave that for the European Union let that be a weight around their neck and they they've created it and that would be very fitting uh, so I I think that would be very reasonable but we just have to wait and see if that if that does actually materialize. Now, what's happening on the ground in the war uh, itself along the front? Uh, quite significant Russian breakthroughs, several kilometers in some parts. Uh, it looks like it's not just the Ukrainian counteroffensive that has faltered, and everyone now acknowledges that it has faltered. Even the, the New York Times, even NATO uh, acknowledge that, but that the Russians are making a counter counter offensive of their own yes that's true uh, this was supposed to be a massive ukrainian offensive it was supposed to sweep southward through kherson and zaporozhia it was also aimed at the donbas region there, there was even the slight possibility in their minds that they could take back bakhmut and what happened instead is now in the east russia is on the offensive they are taking territory there the offensive for ukraine has failed in the south uh, we saw the New York Times admit that 20% of the equipment transferred over to Ukraine was lost. And if that's what they're admitting, one wonders what the actual number is. And then what is the number of uh, manpower lost in this offensive? Because after the, the, the breakthroughs with the equipment failed, they began just sending infantry on foot to try to break through the, the Russian lines. And there have been massive losses for Ukraine. Now, Ukraine still has a, a large amount of offensive potential left. Uh, Russia has layered defenses both in the south and in the east specifically to, to give way, absorb the Ukrainian offensive when the full weight of it hits their lines. And so they may still make a breakthrough. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that Time is not on Ukraine's side. The numbers are not on Ukraine's side, no matter where this offensive ends on the map. Even if they were to take Bakhmut, even if they were to break through the South, wherever their military stops, it'll be utterly exhausted and NATO lacks the capacity to replenish it. That is, uh, in a way, uh, and I see in the Daily Telegraph uh, today uh, in England, the uh, that that's, if you like, the the subplot of the war. Uh, that uh, not only has uh, Ukraine and its soldiers have fought very bravely and sacrificed uh, enormously, uh, but proved, as we all knew would happen, uh, incapable of uh, fighting and defeating Russia. But the subplot is that the military-industrial complex in the NATO countries, including in the United States, is simply not up to the task of a war with Russia. Uh, in fact, they're quite, quite lucky that Russia will probably stop at the Dnipro because they could probably go all the way to Berlin given the current state of the armories and the, the, uh, the uh, ammunition dumps of the NATO countries. That's true. Uh, the, the West collectively has neglected their military industrial output. They have spent decades pursuing these smaller wars against developing nations. We saw these, these wars unfold in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. The United States is still engaged in a lot of these places. Their military industrial complex is geared toward profit rather than 
any sort of purpose. They want to maximize profits and maintaining uh, massive capacity is not profitable. On the other hand, Russia inherited a massive military industrial capacity from the Soviet Union. Not only did they maintain it, but they modernized it and now they're expanding it. And this is something that takes years to do. This is something that the West now realizes they have to do, but they simply don't have time. They're talking about expanding production for their artillery shells by 2027. But when you actually look at the numbers, even when they do that, if they do that, it still will not be enough to sustain the, the daily rate of fire of Ukrainian forces now, which is still sometimes uh, 10 times less than what Russia is firing on the battlefield. So this is an unsolvable problem. And this is why we see uh, the West and also Ukraine focusing on basically PR rather than on sound tactics and strategy on the battlefield. On the other hand, Brian, uh, are things beginning to brighten up uh, in uh, Sino-U.S. relations? Uh, one saw Janet Yellen on magic mushrooms or not, uh, kowtowing to the Chinese minister triple four or five times. And the, to me, as an outsider, and you, you're living and working in the region, there seems like a slight thaw in U.S.-China uh, relations. Have I got that wrong? I would like to believe that there was, but unfortunately, this fits a pattern the United States has followed for many years, where they pose as pursuing diplomacy with their adversaries while behind the scenes continuing to provoke them. And then when their adversary reacts to those provocations behind the scenes, they say, aha, see, we tried diplomacy and they are intent on aggression. So now we have no choice but to pursue more sanctions and more uh, aggression and possibly even war. They've done this with Russia. If people remember then U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and the reset button she gave Sergei Lavrov, the, the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Or if we remember the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal, these were all uh, facades the U.S created to appear to pursue diplomacy all while preparing the dagger of betrayal. And I, I believe they're doing the exact same thing regarding China now. Now, Brian, finally, uh, one of our legends, Simon in Florida, asked me to ask you about PETA in Thailand. I have no idea what he meant, but maybe you do. Uh, PETA is the name of the most recent U.S.-backed opposition leader. Actually, he's more of a proxy for the the actual uh, U.S.-backed opposition leader, a, a billionaire named Tanaton Juang Grung Grung Git. He's unable to run because of his, his legal problems, so now he has PETA as his proxy, and he's trying to become prime minister, and if he cannot... He will have U.S. assistance in mobilizing violent mobs in the streets, once again, uh, creating the same conditions we saw in Ukraine in 2014 or Libya and Syria in 2011. This, re this really is just one playbook the U.S. uses everywhere. And the reason the U.S. is interested in Thailand is because it has such a close relationship with China and the U.S. wants to install a client regime that would put an end to that or even reverse it. Well, a big thanks to Simon in Florida, but an even bigger one to you, Brian Berletic, as always, the master of the new Atlas. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Much obliged to you. Are you worse off than you were this time last year? Answers, please, in our poll on Telegram, on Twitter, on the YouTube community and the YouTube stream. It's not changing. It's overwhelming. But there's still a substantial number of people who are not worse off than they were this time last year. I really would like to hear from them. After the break, I'll be right back. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Now, one of my favorite guests ever on the Mother of All Talk Shows is a man that wears a hat like me. He's Gerald Salenti, aforementioned, and he joins us now on the Mother of All Talk Shows. Gerald, welcome back 
uh, to the show. I know it's not the uh, oh, wonderful, we'll man. wonderful. <laughs> the Battle of the Hats. Battle of the Hats. Now, listen, I know it's not the most important issue, but when the President of the United States falls asleep while talking to the President of Israel, you got to worry, don't you? Oh, yeah, the guy's out of his mind, and it's been going on for a long time. And again, the only reason that uh, the, uh, that Trump won, uh, excuse me, that Biden won, is because people hated Trump so much, so they went out and voted. It wasn't like they loved Biden. And uh, it's a freak show. But look at the freak show you got over there in the UK. From a clown that a, the best cartoonist in the world couldn't come up with a better one than Boris Johnson, to this arrogant little boy that you got playing the Joker now, this uh, Sudak. Uh, and take a look over in France with the little Katzon Macron. It's a freak show everywhere you go. So, uh, and the people just keep buying into it. Is. It is. It is. But your freak uh, is the most powerful freak with the power to tell all the other freaks what they have to do. That's why we pay so much attention to the freak show in Washington. Yeah. And, and, and that those little coward boys and girls across Europe bend over and suck up to a little jerk like that and the morons that represent him show how low they can go. You know, you talked about Gino in the Bronx. You know, I'm a Napolitano. I grew up in the Bronx. And I grew up, I was born in the Bronx. I grew up right after World War II. The height, I'm born in 46, the height of America. You were born to be free. You didn't take anybody's crap. Don't tell me what to do. I won't tell you what to do. Don't tell me what to do. That used to be the attitude. Not anymore. If you don't believe and swallow the crap coming out of the mouth of these little clown boys and girls called politicians and bureaucrats, why, then you believe in misinformation. You're only allowed to swallow government crap in a country near you. So going back to a clown out of his mind, father of a a drug addict that when Biden was playing the senator, passed and promoted three strikes, you're out. The drug war that would have put a kid like his in jail for the rest of his life. That shows you what a crime syndicate it is. Oh, they found coke in the White House? And they stop looking to see who's what it was. There's a damn camera everywhere, every place and every inch. Powerful indeed, Gerald. Now, uh, let's talk about the junkie son for a minute, the junkie gun-toting, uh, underage sex swinging son for a minute. Biden's never turned his back on him. Biden continues to back him and believe him. He's in and out of the White House, with or without his stash, at his own free will. He travels on Air Force One. Uh, he drives around in a pretty little green Corvette uh, with the president. Don't you think the net is closing in on that crime family? Yeah, it's yes and no. You know, it, it's the media that's in charge. And you look at the one that was the mouthpiece for him. Saki before. Where is she now? Uh, she became a prostitute with the uh, with MSNBC. It's one big club. So as long as the media stays away from it, it goes away. It's what the media will create. And again, you know, again, I, I write a magazine, as you know, the Trends Journal. This is the October when it used to be a quarterly. Now it's a weekly over 150 pages a week. This is about the United States overthrow of the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014. 
The article, by the way, was written by Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, former assistant treasury secretary under, under, under Ronald Reagan. Now let's go back to Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden, Christopher Hines of the Hines 57 family, the stepson of that another arrogant little boy, John Kerry, and another guy that I forget his name, but has been convicted of a couple of crimes. They get on the board of directors of Burisma Energy in Ukraine right after the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych by the United States. What does this drug addict know about, about the energy business or Christopher Hines of the Hines 57, the ketchup and the other stuff? What do they know about the energy business and how come they're on the board of directors? You see what a crime syndicate it is? Morons and imbeciles call it a government. It's powerful, uh, Gerald, uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're edging towards despair. Let's try and look forward. Uh, they indicted Donald Trump again, and his popularity went up. What are they going to do next? And that's what I said. As soon as I'll never forget when Trump got elected. And by the way, I'm, I'm not a Trump fan, just to make it clear. I'm a trend forecaster. I look at things the way they are, not the way I want them to be. In the Trends Journal, in the May issue of 2016, we said that Trump would defeat Clinton when all the polls show the opposite. Now let's fast forward. He wins the election. The day after the election, the headline story in USA Today, new president comes to office, I forget with how many uh, lawsuits against them. So it was negative from the start. Then they made up Russiagate, totally fabricated. Again, it's a crime syndicate. And the, and the crime syndicate now in charge is the military industrial complex. The neocons are in charge. Again, you read this article. This is when Obama was president, Victoria Nuland, the undersecretary of state, passing out cookies and cakes in, in Maidan Square over there as the revolution's going on in Ukraine. And now she's a primary war hawk in the Biden administration, along with that other little arrogant clown boy. I went to Dalton. Don't you know who my daddy is? You know, I went to Harvard. You know, those kind of people that are much better than us. Anthony Blinken, the Anthony Blinken that loved every war, every war that America started went over to Saudi Arabia under Obama when he was under Secretary of State. Obama, the Nobel Peace of Crap Prize winner, goes over to Saudi Arabia when they started the war that's killed almost 400,000 Yemeni people, over half of them children. Blinken went over there to give them intelligence as the United States is refueling the Saudi planes so they can keep killing the Yemeni people. Those are the people in the Biden administration. It's not Biden that's running the show. It's the military industrial complex. It's the out of their mind, the non, the, demonic, satanic people that love war and killing that are in charge. If I'm right, Gerald, uh, no Republican stands a chance against Trump for the nomination. And if I'm right that these indictments, this strategy of criminalization, much of it coming from New York, by the way, uh, is actually not harming, but it may be helping uh, Donald Trump uh, to be reelected as president. Uh, I, I still feel that something has got to give because I don't think they can afford a vengeful Donald Trump coming back to uh, office. I, I, I can only imagine, I mean, talk about lock them up, lock them up. I can only imagine 
who he's going to lock up next time. So what do they do? How do they stop him? It's simple. You have to look at the other. Yes, Trump has a high popularity rating, but then you have to look at the other polls. The people don't want Biden or Trump. So what they're doing is they're telling you the polls of this against that. No, no, no. You have to look at the other polls. And the other polls show they don't want any of them. And that's why I think, but again, it's going to be a wild card. RFK Jr. to me is the best bet. And the reason, but again, they're going to keep going after him on this anti-vax thing as they keep going after him. And as I keep telling them, stop talking about this. You know, there was a line under the Clint when Bill Clinton ran for president in 1992. Behind the scenes line in the campaign was, quote, it's the economy, stupid. That's what you have to focus on. You have to focus on the issues that hit the people in their pocketbook. Get away from this vax stuff because that's all they're going after him for. This guy has the name and the background. And you mentioned before about his family coming out after him. You know, one of the things I say, you want to know why the world's so screwed up? Take a look at your family. You don't have to look so far. So anyway, well, go back to Well, I've got a fantastic family, but he doesn't appear to. He doesn't appear to. I mean, Most families they're, they're, they're actually... Fighting. They're actually they're actually rats. They're attacking their own family member, like uh, Pavlo, Pavlovian dogs, uh, at the behest of what Joe Biden. Again, you know, it it it's it, it's the mentality, and 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 so the people are looking for something new. Again, I do polls, I do data. You know, that's what the magazine's about. You go back to the midterm elections. The reason why the Republicans didn't win bigger, again, it's not what you want, what you like, or what you believe in. It's the facts why. is because a lot of young people went out to vote because of the Roe versus Wade issue, the abortion issue, which the Republicans supported anti-abortion and the Democrats said no. That's why the Republicans didn't win big. So going back to the data, the data is showing that young people don't want to vote for Biden in the Democratic Party. So they'll go another way. And then you have a big independent voice. So if this election is done properly, I believe that RFK Jr. could win. I don't I don't want to have it right here in front of me, but had I known we'd be talking about this. I began my career at a graduate school, making a long story short. I worked on political campaigns in Westchester County in New York, which is the richest county at the time back in the 1970s. A guy ran for mayor in Yonkers, which is a city of over 200,000 people. Angelo Martinelli became the longest running mayor. I worked on district attorney, senators, campaigns, Congress. I was... They sent me to Albany. They were grooming me. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. I designed and instructed America's first course called American Politics and Campaign Technology, basically how to run a campaign. And I taught it at St. John's University. This was my background. I got into it. I know how this game is played. The game has to be played now you don't go heavy. You go in and out. You go in and out. And then when the primaries are coming up in June, you start going very, very heavy around March and April. The people have short minds. All this stuff in the past isn't going to add up to anything. So if Kennedy runs the right kind of campaign, he could start beating Trump in the primary, uh, Biden in the primaries. And I believe, I know, that if he gets the Democratic nomination, he'll wipe Trump out. I agree, but that's such a huge if. Can they really allow Bobby Kennedy to be the nominee? Wouldn't they try some 
Bernie Sanders type maneuvers to block that? Oh, it would be more than a Bernie Sanders type uh, a movement. It would be more like a JFK or an RFK movement. Poof. Jack, you're dead. What did Kennedy come out and say? The CIA who killed his father and his, uh, his, uh, his uncle. I have a photo. Again, uh, uh, next time I'll show it to you. You know John Connolly. John Connolly was the Democratic yeah, the governor. governor of Texas that sat in front of Kennedy that took the bullet in the back. I have a photograph of me, John Connolly, and his wife, Nellie, in front of the book depository, 1992, two weeks before the presidential election. He wanted to meet me because in one of my books, Trend Tracking, I had forecast in 89 that to be a new political party and someone like Ross Perot would be that guy. He wanted to meet me. I'm making a long story short. They were, by the way, this was their first time back since the assassination. We're going back into the Anatole Hotel. And he said to me, you know, Gerald, I read your book. He said, a fine piece of work. And I know your heart's in the right place. He said, well, you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people. Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. This isn't only the John, the, the, the Connolly that took the bullet in the back, sitting in front of JFK. This is the John Connolly that became the Republican Treasury Secretary under Richard Nixon that took us off the gold standard. It's a crime syndicate that morons and imbeciles call a government. They have stole. Oh, we had the 4th of July here a couple of weeks ago. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What the hell are you talking about? Happiness? Close down your business. I'm your mayor. I'm your governor. I'm the clown in charge. We're fighting the COVID war and stand one meter apart because the wind blows in straight lines exactly a meter. Doesn't go around, up and down. All right? It's all gone. It's a crime syndicate run by out of their mind, arrogant, narcissistic, pathological liars. End of story. And I was there. I was on the other side. By the way, it was the worst job I ever had in my life. And I quit after one year up in the Senate. You're some man, Gerald Salenti, as always. Not just a pleasure, but a privilege to interview you. Thank you very much indeed for joining and us. Thank you for Gerald's what you do. Trends Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. God bless you. It's really, his work is actually a gold mine. Anybody interested in politics, political trends, economic trends, social trends, cultural trends, you have to follow him. Gerald Salente. I'll be right back after the short break. Some great Patreon comments. Martin Higgins, I'm a huge fan of uh, RFK Jr. and agree with most of what he says, but in the cold light of day, do you think his voice will go against his success? I've just listened to the podcast with Joe Rogan and I'm ashamed to admit, I find him a bit difficult to listen to. Your thoughts, Gigi? It's a, a fair point, Martin. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. A voice is an important thing in politics. I think that people will get used to it and, and get past it. Uh, I definitely prefer to read what he says rather than listen to it. But his passion somehow comes through on the issues that he's passionate about. And, you know, uh, FDR got elected in a wheelchair and people knew he was in a wheelchair, even though he was never put on the screen. Uh, Matthew White says, listening to moats on a Wednesday and Sunday is about the only way to stay sane across any given seven-day period. Graham Briggs White says, nobody is better off as the price of everything has gone up, yet they can pay for the upkeep of an unnecessary, stupid proxy war. Congratulations, George, on Chris Williamson join, joining the Workers' Party of Britain. Thanks for everything, Graham. You are a big, big friend. 
Daniela Modascotter, another big friend, says, Yes, I'm much worse off than last year, as I'm on disability benefits due to an accident at work a few years ago. The world is tired of this proxy war. Uh, now, Derek has emailed the show. I was wondering why the bank was stupid enough to pick on somebody like Farage, but I think Tony just explained it. Let's go to the lines. Matthew is in West London commenting on our poll. Go ahead, Matthew. Hi, George. Um, I'm here to do penance. I'm one of those 28% of people that's doing pretty well. So, well, who report is doing pretty well. Um, so I thought I'd prostrate myself before you. And, but, you know, are you doing better? Uh, it's, good. it's good that you're doing uh, pretty well. I like people doing well. Uh, but how come you're better off this year than last when inflation is uh, running riot, when energy costs are what they are, when mortgage payments have doubled, even trebled in some people's mm-hmm. cases? H- how are you better off this year than last? The truth is, George, it's dumb luck. I happen to be working in a sector that's doing pre- that's one of the few sectors that's doing okay. IT slash technology. So that's one of those few areas that's still right. got some good profit margins doing our companies. But that's a matter purely of where I'm placed rather than any, um, any merit on my part. But, well, you know, it's been a good year. Hopefully I've done good work over the past year, but I can't claim control over the economy as a whole. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you're not denying, I know, uh, just how hard uh, your fellow countrymen and women have now got it. Uh, it- it's only... Uh, it's only it's only about ten weeks to the winter, and I think people are looking towards that winter with very severe severe trepidation. Don't you? Hundred um, percent. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm originally a working class kid. My um, was raised mostly by my aunt, and God bless her soul, she's worked forty five years in the same factory, and they and ever since they busted the unions in the eighties and you know, shut down the closed shops and all that. Um, it's just the pay rises have never really come through for her. And ultimately, you know, she's barely, no. in real terms, her pay has not gone up for at least 20 years now. It's 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 disgusting. She's making, you know, I would estimate probably 15,000 pounds a year for 35 good, um, 55, 35 good hours of work, uh, work a week. You know, it's it's disgusting how rapacious this is, like that um, so many, you know, the factory owners are in that regard. Um, I did want to pivot a little bit from anecdote, though, George, because I want to talk about, uh, just share some quick thoughts I've had on the Coots shutting down for Roger's bank accounts, if you'll uh, forgive the indulgence. Yeah. Um, I, I did yeah, some time ago over the subject access request that Farage obtained the, where the Coots people went over, where they shut him out of his account. Uh, uh, one thing that really stood out for me, uh, alongside the Russia hating nonsense, was the fact that one of the major conflict of values they cited was Farage's ep- opposition to net zero and climate to change catastrophism. It's made me ask a question of something I've thought about for quite a while. Why is it that so many of these elites, these financial elites, hate Farage so much, despite him being, by his own admission, being a virtually a fatuate? Um, I almost think that there's something that this commitment to net zero is an interesting through line. Because these are financial capitalists. People whose wealth and status is tied to institutions that don't really create anything. They don't build anything. They just move other people's around, people's money around, they take a cut of it. And Farage, you know, he's an ex toy trader, is something different to them. He bought and traded metals. That's gosh to these people. They think it's kind of disgusting, you know, lowly as opposed to, you know, manipulating mortgage rates at scale of of a nonsense like that. In their eyes, he's the last political ally Mm. of the industrial capitalists, you know, the dwindling remnants of the elite whose wealth and status actually came from building and creating things. And those executives of Coots, you know, the elites of the city, the media, the civil service, they hate these people. Because for all that can be said about these industrialists, and much should be said about these industrialists, they actually want to create, grow the pie and create wealth. And the bankers don't really care. They don't mind a shrinking pie where they have a large share of it. Net zero is a big legitimate ideology for these people. It excuses degrowth, which effectively screws over much of the working class in the Western world, alongside the development of the global south and developing countries. It's a religious ideology that justify the fact that they stay wealthy. They stay at the top. 
they keep their big slice of the pie at the expense of economic growth and development for everybody else. And Nigel Farage is one of the, he's representative of that small dwindling block of elites in the West, very small, that ultimately try and, uh, uh, want to actually do some development. It's not an equitable development, but it's development nonetheless. And I think that's the through line. This hate, the net zero stuff, the hatred of Russia, which, you know, for all, again, for all its faults, is largely a, still a commodity producing country, an industrialized country. These financial capitalists, they don't want any of that. They just want to extract and maintain high status relative to everybody else. That's the through line, I think. And that's, I thought to get, and that's, all, that's the, um, my uh, ultimate reason for calling up. Well, I've got to tell you, uh, it's one of the best calls I've ever heard. Uh, I think the, the ontology uh, you rolled out is absolutely correct. Uh, I think that uh, much can be explained by listening, replaying uh, your, your phone call, your analysis. Uh, I demur only on this. Um, I don't know Farage all that well, but I know uh, that he was uh, pretty keen to get that job at GB News, and GB News does not pay any. Uh, from that, I infer uh, that Farage is not all that wealthy. Uh, businesses don't pay him. Uh, he has the ground a bit at LBC, for example, which also does not pay great money, although he was getting more than your normal presenter on LBC would get. Ditto at GB News, is, but that's not much to say if you get my drift. So I'm assuming that the capitalists, the fan like Kutz and Co., uh, who hate him for his opposition to uh, net zero, for his opposition to all the quackery and greenery uh, that the uh, globalized finance capitalists have made their own religion, they definitely don't pay him. And the number of, if you like, as you characterize the industrial capitalists who are ready to pay a guy like Farage, I think they must be small in number and shy of association with Farage. I don't mean to say he's poor, he's far richer than me, but he's by no means rich. Uh, and that is of significance and interest, because you're absolutely right. Whilst I have spent my whole life opposing industrial capitalists and standing on picket lines outside their plants and so on, at least they were trying to make things. At least they were trying to grow the economy and especially their share of it. These other speculators, gamblers, casino economic, blackjack, Merchants, these money changers, money lenders. These people don't care about making things. They're quite happy for China to make the things. As long as they can keep their position in control of our part of the globalized capitalist system and the media that they employ, with the exception of GB News, and obviously, programs like this, people, as it were, off the grid, but increasingly attracting far bigger audiences. Our audience compared to GB News is gigantic compared to GB News. Even Farage. More people watch this show than watch Farage. More people watch this show than watch the entire output of Rupert Murdoch's talk TV in an entire week. But of the terrestrial media, only GB News, representing exactly the sectors of British society that you just adumbrated, takes anything like a disparate view to the 
overwhelming corporate media, which is gung-ho for war, gung-ho for all the greenery and quackery, and especially the greenbacks that come with it. A great call, Matthew. I'm sorry if I took too long to respond to it. So many comments on Gerald Salente's interview. Christine Peach says, Gerald sure cuts to the chase. He does that on the truth about many current politicians. Some people cannot handle that. Maybe someday they'll smarten up. And Jay Topo says, Gerald is a valuable asset to us all. Spades have always been spades with Gerald Salente. There's no time for my final thoughts and ruminations. I'm already over the time and I'll have to pay people a full hour uh, for going an hour, a minute and a half afterwards. And it's difficult these days for me to do it. So accept my apologies if you did not get through. If I spoke too long in response to some of the callers, uh, a double apology for that. I'll be back, of course, God willing, on Sunday at the earlier time of 7 p.m. UK time. Please remember the time difference. So 7 p.m. UK time on Sunday. The mother ship, the mother of all talk shows. Another million plus audience over the last seven days, but not yet two million. And I won't be satisfied until I'm able to say the word to every week at the end of the show. Thanks for joining me. 